Hello scholars, welcome. Professor Hinkle here. Today we're going to talk about the open ocean, the pelagic environment, and what animals live there. So this is what I think about sharks. Fascinating. Not that scary. They've been demystified through Shark Week and actually watching people swim with great whites hanging on to their top fin. Really amazing. So the biodiversity of this group is much smaller than the benthic, but very important because it includes keystone species and our marine fisheries, which are what we're getting into today. The pelagic environment is the open ocean with plankton floaters and nectin swimmers. The plankton that are animals are zooplankton as opposed to phytoplankton, which were primary producers. Zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, and then consumers eat the zooplankton, secondary, tertiary, up to the keystone apex species. So our main types of zooplankton, which are animals because they consume primary producers, photosynthetic organisms, are going to be the radiolarians, uh, made of silica tests, which are the shells, variety of shapes, sizes, very intricate ornaments. You get the forams, or the foraminifera, uh, very small, mostly abundant as planktonic calcium carbonate tests. We're going a little bit bigger, we've got copepods. These are microscopic, so this is an electron microscope. Um, segmented bodies and joints, great sizes. Remember, these are plankton, so they're floaters. And then we've got krill, crustaceans that resemble mini shrimp or large copepods. They can grow up to about two inches and really important for Antarctic food webs where ma whales like to go in their summer season. We can get to bigger zooplankton, jellyfish, Portuguese man of war. Jellyfish actually isn't a fish at all. It's a zooplankton. What? Yes, yeah, specifically a scyphozoan, soft, low density body, can be microscopic all the way up to about six and a half feet. Hydrozoans include the Portuguese man of war. These are an interesting, really interesting thing. Uh, four different organisms working all together. Both can be very deadly if they sting you with their tentacles. Nectin include fish, squid, marine mammals, sea turtles. Everything that, f that swims in the ocean basically is nectin. And swimming is primarily driven by alternating contraction and relaxation of myomeres on opposite sides, giving us most common, like sharks, thuniform, which this tail fin or caudal fin uh, moves back and forth. We've got ammiform, is undulation along the dorsal fin. Labriform, sculling with the pectoral fins. Or ostraciform, paired paddling by the dorsal and the anal fin to propel through water. There's adaptations for deep ocean fish, or deep ocean uh, swimmers, I should say, which include bioluminescence and counterillumination. Basically, I'm going to set off a little light. Hey, look at this. It's food. Something comes over, gobble, eat them up. Or you can't see me because I'm counterilluminating, so it looks like I blend in with the environment to protect myself. A lot of these deep organisms have big eyes so that they can see big jaws that unhinge huge teeth for eating each other. It's hard down there in the deep ocean. You got to adapt to the conditions so that you can survive. Fish will school together to avoid predation. It makes it look like there's more of them than there are and their strength in numbers. Um, fish can also camouflage. There are special adaptations all the way to flying fish to fly out of the water to avoid predation. So it's all about eating and not being eaten down here in this environment. So there's lots of adaptations for that. There's also working with each other or against each other. So symbiosis is when two or more organisms form a relationship that can be mutually beneficial. 
In the case of commensalism, one organism benefits without harming its hosts. Mutualism comes to the benefit of both organisms. And then parasitism benefits one organism at the expense of the host. So various types of uh, symbiosis. Again, these are adaptations to avoid predation. So marine mammals. This is pretty cool. Marine mammals are vertebrates, meaning they have a backbone. And Tiktaalik is the transitionary fossil between a fish and a tetrapod. So at some point, fish in the ocean made their way on land. And we see this in the fossil record through Tiktaalik. That tetrapod developed a spine and then millions of years later, one of those vertebrates decided, you know what, I think I want to go back in the ocean and went back in, thus giving us marine mammals, amazing ancestors of ours, directly related. Look at how many uh, similarities there are. Warm blooded, yes, breathe air, check, that's what we have. Hair fur, yes, bear live young, mammary glands, yes, wow. So when we're thinking about marine mammals, we can break them up into these three orders, Carnivora, Sirenia, Cetacea, and then we can further look at some of these groups of organisms, which is what we'll get into. Carnivora, we've got this adorable sea otter, loves kelp forests, hunted almost to extinction, and can use stony tools, put some like shellfish on their tummy, and grab a rock and bam, 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 smash it until it opens up, so cool. I tried to find the cutest photos of these, by the way. Um, polar bears have huge bear paws. They're great swimmers. They eat mostly seals by cracking through the ice, swimming down and finding their prey. And then their hair is hollow, kind of like a double paned window. If you upgrade the windows on your house, you want one pane of glass and then another pane of glass creating a pocket of air between that air creates in tremendous insulation. And the same thing happens in the fur of a polar bear. Their thick fur is like being covered with double pane glass that helps them stay warm in these very frigid environments. Pinnipeds are also carnivora. This is a suborder. And pinniped means fin or flipper-footed. Here we see flippers, flippers, flippers. Walrus are so cool, they're really big, big tusks. They've got those front flippers. Um, they live in the ocean. They spend a lot of time on land. Seals, also called earless seals or harbor seals, don't have ears. And then sea lions are actually, they look very similar, but the main difference is they're going to have ears. Again, all of these have those front flippers that propel them through the water. The order Serenia is composed of dugongs and manatees. These are wild looking creatures. And for them specifically, they don't eat other animals. They are herbivorous. So they eat a lot of uh, shallow water coastal grasses, as you can see here. They can get really big, 14, 15 feet, and they live in coastal areas. Cetacea. Whales, dolphins, porpoises, a whole lot of them. Not much hair on these. They've got uh, big elongated skulls, blow holes on the top so that they can breathe. A fluke, which is their horizontal tail fin, which they use for vertical propulsion. They have very specific adaptations, including a streamlined body, a very special skin structure that's 80% water with a stiff inner layer, adaptations for deep diving, which include extreme oxygen efficiency, collapsible lungs, and turning off certain systems that they don't need. It's like when you go out of town and you turn out the lights and you unplug some outlets and you're like, well, I don't need these right now. It's what these cetacea can do when they dive really deep. Odontoceti, which means toothed whale. So these are the whales that have teeth. Porpoises have a smaller stout body shape and a blunt snout. Dolphins have pointy teeth, a longer rostrum, and a more streamlined shape with the snout that sticks out. 
killer whales, maybe the most famous of all the whales because they're the only ones that actually hunt other marine mammals and actually hunt sharks. That's amazing. And then sperm whales, these are the largest of the toothed whales, which you could consider dolphins and porpoises actually to be whales. They can weigh up to 50 tons, eat 3% of their body weight, and here's a little baby traveling with its mom. It's really cool. These odontoceti actually use echolocation to uh, send sound through water. That sound is reflected and comes back, interpreted in their brain to know what's around them. So this is a pretty cool thing where they can sense what's out there through the noises that they make in this process of echolocation. Tooth whales are incredibly smart. Here we can see their brains are almost as big as human brains. Monkeys are smaller, cats and dogs are much smaller. Dolphins are trainable. They've assisted humans with uh, drownings and support and they put on pretty cool shows in some places. And yeah, they're incredibly intelligent. Killer whales, massively intelligent. Mustached whales, this is a whale mustache. Kind of like my mustache. Except my mustache doesn't just filter seawater to feed me. So this isn't truly a mustache, um, but it looks like that. What it is, is called a baleen. And so the mysticeti or the mustached whales are baleen whales that are filter feeders. They have fibrous plates that make a sieve where their mouth fills with water that traps fish, krill, plankton, and lets the water back out so they can then digest all the food, the food that they're eating. Remember, these are animals. They vocalize sounds for specific purposes, which we're still learning about currently, and it's pretty fantastic. So let's go through our various mustached whales, or baleen whales is another way that you will hear this term. We've got blue whales, the biggest animals on Earth, up to 100 feet, 441,000 pounds. Their tongues can weigh as much as an elephant, and if we see an elephant for scale, they are extremely bigger, much, much bigger. They're the loudest animals on the planet and can grow to be to the age of 90 years old. So almost comparable to a human lifespan, which is really amazing. Humpback whales are great migrators. They'll migrate the longest distance of any marine mammal. They sing for unknown reasons, and they feed in this really cool method called bubble net. Check the video, it's amazing. But basically, there's, one, there's a group of humpback whales, and one will make a little circle and let go of some bubbles, bloop, 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 bloop. There's a school of fish above them. When the bubbles go up, all these whales then whoo, travel straight up to the top of the water. They open their mouths and they all breach the surface of the water, grabbing as many fish. It's hard to see, but there's a whale, 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 whale. Here's a couple whales with open mouths. Really awesome. It's an incredible thing that happens, a true work of community and support for each other to reach a common goal. Gray whales, baleen whales, they've got Spots, they're pockmarked all over them, which are scars that are left by parasites. These can grow pretty big, 43 to 49 feet when mature, and have an excellent migration from down on the Gulf of Mexico up to the Arctic Ocean every summer. So if you're in California and you want to go whale watching, we can actually go gray whale watching because they have this resident population of 200 whales that goes up and down the coast every single year, basically following the primary productivity in order to stay alive. Right whales, finback whales, more baleen whales. Um, finbacks are calm and benign. They're the second largest animal on the planet, mostly plankton for dinner, don't like shallow water, and then right whales are long, fine, with no dorsal fin. 
all of the cetacea, here's all of the whales with a human up here for scale. Porpoises and dolphins, we've got sperm whale, gray whale, the big old blue whale, humpback whale, killer whale, and their various relative sizes. Pretty cool. Marine mammals doing their thing, swimming around in the ocean. So for a long time, people were whaling. It's a great treasure to pull a whale out of the ocean. And their blubber and fat was used for kerosene, for oil, for fuel, for a whole wide range of things. But there's only so many whales in the ocean, and it became pretty clear really early on that whaling was basically emptying our oceans of whales. And so 1948, the International Whaling Committee established, and it basically, um, over the course of the next 30, 40 years, got to the point where whaling was banned, 1986, no more commercial whaling, we're killing all the whales in the ocean, and we need them, these large species. Right now, there's three ways to legally hunt. You could either object and say, ah, I'm not going to do that. You can whale for scientific purposes, for what we can learn, or you can, uh, indigenous cultures can conduct aboriginal subsistence whaling. Unfortunately, illegal whaling still occurs. Also, Japan, Norway, and Iceland are still whaling. They object. They say, nope, we're going to whale. We don't care about the IWC. Um, <clears throat> gray whale hunting was banned in 1938. This is how long ago, almost 100 years, we realized, oh, we're killing all the gray whales. It was removed in 1993 because of recovery, which shows it exemplifies if we stop harvesting or hunting specific species, they can come back. Life is very resilient and is used to disturbances. And if we implement the right environmental policy and protect various species, they don't have to die. We don't have to fish the oceans to extinction. In fact, we could fish the oceans in a way that is uh, in harmony with those ecosystems in order to utilize these resources for our life and many lives to come. So let's talk about fish, aquatic animals with limbs that only live in water. Who knows how many species of fish there are, but there's a lot. Right now about 34,000 have been identified and counting, and fish live in pretty much every environment in the ocean. Rocky shores, sediment shores, kelp forests, deep waters. They live on land and river streams and ponds. They're a really amazing thing that have adapted a swim bladder with oxygen that can increase in deep water so that they can still breathe. And it also helps them float up and down. Fish have a variety of fins all around their body and this really cool lateral line which senses the water pressure so that they know where they are and what they need to change as far as their swim bladder goes and which one of all those fins they need to propel themselves to get through the water. <clears throat> Marine fisheries. People eat fish. Fish is a really, really large industry. So because people eat fish, we have commercial fishing. Most of it happens on continental shelves, tropical shelves, non-tropical shelves. There's areas of upwelling, primary productivity, leading to fish. There's coasts and coral, and then a very small amount of open ocean fishing happens also. But for the most part, primary productivity happens along coasts. Biodiversity happens along coasts. Fish live along coasts, and marine fisheries and commercial fishing also occurs on coasts. Well, we are at this point where <clears throat> the oceans are overfished. And overfishing is when fish stock is harvested too rapidly. Juveniles, small fish, can't grow big enough to reproduce. And we can think of this in terms of the maximum sustainable yield. So it's pretty simple. If we take more fish out of the ocean than can reproduce, we are going to deplete that resource. And this is what we have seen for a long time, and current trends are pointing in that direction for this to continue to occur. 
some staggering facts. <clears throat> 80% of 523 mar marine fish stocks are fully exploited, overexploited, or depleted. People are eating more fish. 93 million tons of fish are caught every year. 30% of current fishing stocks are overfished. Most fishing growth comes from large companies. This is across the board for environmentalism. That's the big companies with the largest impact. Illegal fishing is happening, driving populations down. Endangered species are being killed by the process of bycatch. 55% of the world's oceans are industrial, industrial fished. Important fishing stocks might be gone in 25 years and ocean protections are overestimated. It does not look good for fish right now. Especially the large fish. Large fish are keystone species. They're important for healthy marine ecosystems. They prevent smaller fish from overpopulating. They cull the sick and old herbivore populations. Modern fishing practices has taken about 90% of the large fish out of the ocean. It changes the distribution for the age and size range, the effects of which we can't even know yet. We will, in time, one way that we can help to offset some of these impacts is to stop harvesting large fish, leaving large fish in the oceans. <clears throat> So are we at the end of fish? Current predictions say that if it's business as usual, 2050, there's no more fish in the oceans. Why? Because we fished them all out of it through these various practices. Not only is overfishing a problem, but so is habitat loss, marine environmental destruction, marine pollution that is being given out into the world. So there's a lot of things that are happening here in these environments. Recreational fishing is not without its own harm, especially to some specific <coughs> some specific species. Excuse me. <clears throat> so much to say, so excited to say it. Mm. Sometimes my voice gets away from me. Uh, catch and release can help, as we see here, but when uh, People are taking fish out of the oceans. It's real simple. Take fish out of the oceans. They can't reproduce. We deplete our, we deplete our fish supply. So there's <coughs> the reported catch and the estimated catch, which is higher than the reported because people are underreporting. And there's also illegal fishing happening. But the trend that we see is from the 50s to now, it's increasing. How much are we fishing the oceans? A lot. We can see since about 2000 it started to level off, that's good, necessary, because of fisheries collapse. The certain fisheries have already become overexploited. There's no fish left already. So it forces people to go deeper into the ocean, to find other types of fish, to exploit other marine fisheries. Again, the trends are not good. <clears throat> Bycatch is the process of incidental fish being caught by fishing equipment. So you want to fish halibut, but what you get are dolphins and birds and turtles and sharks caught in the nets. What do you do with them? Nothing. You throw them overboard because that's not what your interest. There's no money in them. This is called incidental catch or bycatch. So what do we do? Protect marine fisheries, instill environmental policy. How do we enforce it? Very, very hard to do because who owns the oceans? Do you own it? Do I own it? They're part of Team Earth, I think, for sure. But when we're looking at international agreements for the open ocean, um, it's really hard. And also, we live on land. Who cares about the ocean? It's over there. No big deal. Let me just kick my waist down the curb. I'll never see it again. Throw it in the ocean. It can take it. The oceans are intricately related to the health of land. We as human beings do not survive this planet. We do not continue to thrive if we pollute, harm, and overfish our oceans. It's simple as that. So we can bring in policy 
banning drift nets or gill nets, um, regulating. But the thing is here, it's really hard because of all the various mechanisms of fishing. Purse side nets, long lines, bottom trawls, gill nets, seafloor traps, all of these various things can be discarded or left in the ocean, leading to the practice of ghost fishing, which is when old fishing gear is left. Who's going to say anything? Oh, my nets are tied up. Oh, it's going to take forever. I can't cut them loose. Cheaper to cut them loose, buy new ones, then try and fix these ones. Well, they still catch fish. But if they're catching fish, those fish just die for nothing. And that's a sad practice. So what do we do? We manage. We manage our fisheries. Marine protection. Environmental policy. Hard to do in the oceans, as mentioned, though, because who owns them? Who's enforcing them? Where's the ocean police? The oceans are too big for police to go around and say, are you fishing correctly? Uh, <clears throat> also, the amount of boats in the ocean is continuing to increase. How do we decrease the amount of fish being pulled in the oceans if from the 70s onward it continues to increase how many fishing boats? And these boats are subsidized by the government. So there needs to be a really big overhaul in the way that we think about and approach fishing in the ocean. If we looked at the effectiveness of fisheries management across the world, it's not very good. It's not good. Fish are declining, even though we've got these policies. Fish are declining. Some fish are able to rebound, but this is only when they've become so low that there's literally no fish left to fish. And it's incredibly hard to enforce bans, restrict people from fishing because people can go out and fish pretty much anything they want to. By the year 2050, every dot on here needs to be green or else there will be no fish left in the ocean. It's simple as that. <clears throat> so depleting these stocks leads to going into the deeper ocean. Deeper ocean has a practice of bottom trawling. This basically scoops up everything on the ocean bottom in the benthic environment, removes marine sediments, creates incredible long-lasting damage to these deep sea ecosystems. This is not a good solution. It's sad that because we've depleted nearshore environments and overexploited marine fisheries, we have to move further out, now upsetting the balance of deep sea ocean communities. There needs to be a greater public awareness and outcry that these practices in the ocean are not okay because, as I've mentioned so many times, we need our oceans. <clears throat> What can you do? This is my favorite thing. Well, I eat fish. Do you eat fish? Maybe. If so, are you eating overexploited fish? Have you ever thought of that? Maybe we could. Maybe we could before we purchase fish. <clears throat> we could look at what is overexploited. Tuna, shark, shrimp. These are overexploited. Um, aquaculture, farm seafood, Alaskan salmon. There's the Monterey Bay Institute has the seafoodwatch.org. You can literally go to this website, www.seafoodwatch.org and type in or even look at their recommendations. These are sustainable fish populations. These are overexploited fish populations. <clears throat> Eat this fish and not this fish. So ecosystem-based fishery management, it's like this. <clears throat> For millions of years, nature knew how to do it. It developed these ecosystems with biodiversity, creating natural checks and balances, moving towards sustainability and equilibrium where species would adapt to survive underneath the conditions. And then our technological revolution has allowed us to develop techniques to overexploit, to become the dominant force, to have great amounts of impacts. <clears throat> now that we see that, we've said, oh, we've made some problems. So what do we do? We look to nature. How does nature do it? How do these ecosystems function? 
and we model practices after ecosystems in order to support and contribute sustainability. So this is done by focus on maintaining the natural structure and function of ecosystems and their productivity, incorporating human use and values into ecosystems to manage resources, recognizing that ecosystems are dynamic and constantly changing and that we need to also change with them, create a shared vision based on all the stakeholders, so not just the fishermen, not just the companies, but also the recreational users, also us who want healthy oceans. Use scientific knowledge adapted by continual learning and monitoring. So it's saying, let's use nature as an example, let's use the best science we can, include everyone, and actually enforce environmental policy in a way that doesn't kill our Earth, that supports our Earth. And there is a way. It's not going to be easy, but it is definitely possible. So in conclusion, the pelagic is a big area. There's a lot of animals in it that are incredibly important for the ocean biodiversity. Marine mammals have developed special adaptations to live there. Our global marine fisheries are under threat. But with thought, time, care, with your attention and contribution, we can start to manage these fisheries effectively by conversations, through voting, through signing petitions, joining organizations, and on a very fundamental level, caring. If you care about our oceans, it will prompt <clears throat> others around you to care, and you will care enough to take action. And if we're all caring together, then we can work together to protect our oceans and our marine fisheries. So thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you in the next one.